1943, the skies over Europe belonged to death. Every morning, as the sun rose over England, hundreds of young American airmen climbed into B-17 Flying Fortresses and B-24 Liberators, knowing they were flying into a world that wanted them dead. These were farm boys from Iowa, factory workers from Detroit, college students from California, barely out of their teens, yet carrying the weight of war on their shoulders. Bundled into heavy flight suits to survive the freezing temperatures at 25,000 feet, they clutched lucky charms. Photographs of their families, letters, prayers, and the quiet knowledge of the odds stacked against them. Before dawn, briefing rooms filled with tension. Maps spread across tables, marking the targets of the day. Factories, oil refineries, rail yards deep in the heart of Germany. Intelligence officers described the defenses they would face. Flak batteries lining the countryside, German fighter squadrons poised to strike, the expected casualties. The young men listened silently, their faces betraying nothing, their hands tightening around coffee cups, aware that each sortie could be their last. When the bombers roared off the flight lines, the sky became a battlefield. German Messerschmitt 109s and Focke-Wulf 190s descended like angry hornets, diving through formations with cannons blazing, attacking head-on from the sides and from behind. The bomber's gunners fired back desperately, 50-caliber machine guns hammering as fighters pressed closer, aiming for engines, the cockpit, the tail, and the bomb bays. Rockets streaked through the air, tracer rounds illuminated clouds, and anti-aircraft fire, flak, erupted in deadly bursts, black clouds of shrapnel that could tear an aircraft apart in seconds. Every sound, ping, ping, ping of bullets hitting aluminum, was a reminder that the sky itself was designed to kill them. Each bomber carried ten men, pilot and co-pilot in the cockpit, navigating and fighting through flak and fighter attacks. A navigator hunched over instruments, a bombardier in the nose, guiding the plane on the most dangerous minutes of the mission, a flight engineer manning the top turret, a radio operator doubling as a waste gunner, two waste gunners braving freezing temperatures through open windows, a ball turret gunner curled beneath the fuselage, spinning to track attackers below, and a tail gunner sitting alone at the rear, the most vulnerable of all. These men worked together, fought together, trusted each other with their lives, and all too often died together. When a bomber went down, ten lives were usually lost. If any survived, it was through luck or extraordinary skill. Some became prisoners of war. Some were killed even as they parachuted to safety. The losses were staggering. During Black Week in October 1943, the Eighth Air Force lost 148 bombers in just seven days. 1,500 men killed, wounded, missing, or captured, and families back home received the dreaded telegrams, We regret to inform you. For most crews, the life expectancy was 11 missions, yet 25 were required to complete a tour. The mathematics were brutal. Statistically, only one in four crews would survive. The military worked frantically to protect their aircraft without overloading them. Armor added weight, reducing bomb loads, fuel, or maneuverability. Yet every pound mattered. Adding too much risked grounding the planes. Too little, and crews continued dying at unsustainable rates. Engineers studied hundreds of bombers after every mission, measuring every bullet hole, every piece of shrapnel damage, photographing the wreckage, and compiling diagrams. The patterns seemed obvious. Fuselages, wings, and tails were riddled with holes. Engines, cockpits, and fuel systems appeared mostly untouched. Conventional wisdom dictated that armor should go where the damage was worst. But the planes that returned were only half the story. At Columbia University, a secret team of mathematicians, statisticians, and economists, the Statistical Research Group, was working tirelessly to analyze the war through numbers, equations, and probabilities. Among them was Abraham Wald, 
a refugee from Austria, a brilliant mathematician who had narrowly escaped Nazi persecution, leaving behind most of his family, who would tragically perish in Auschwitz. Wald had been homeschooled in a rigorous, multilingual and religious environment, later earning a doctorate in mathematics from the University of Vienna, but barred from academic positions due to anti-Semitic quotas. He arrived in America in 1938, eventually joining Columbia University, and by the war, he was among the brightest minds analyzing life and death problems through numbers instead of bullets. As Wald examined the diagrams of returning bombers, he asked a question that no one else had considered. Where were the planes that did not return? Why did engines show little damage? Why were cockpits and fuel systems relatively unscathed? Wald realized the engineers were studying a biased sample, the survivors. The planes that were shot down, those hit fatally in the engines or cockpit, were not in the data. The absence of damage in these areas on surviving aircraft was not evidence of safety, but proof of vulnerability. His insight was revolutionary. Armor should not go where damage was visible, but where planes could not survive being hit. Fuselage, wings, and tails could absorb damage and remain airborne. Engines, cockpits, and fuel systems were fatal if struck. Wald formalized this insight into rigorous statistical analysis, calculating the unseen damage on lost aircraft from the surviving sample, a method that would save countless lives. This principle, now known as survivorship bias, transformed operational research, military strategy, and statistical thinking. Wald's methods guided decisions on bomber armor, helicopter protection, and armored vehicles in later conflicts, and informed medical trials, quality control, and economic forecasting. His work extended far beyond war. It taught the world to ask uncomfortable questions, to consider the missing data, to recognize the limitations of what we can observe, and to infer the unseen consequences of what is absent. Tragically, in 1950, Wald died in a plane crash in India at the age of 48, but his legacy endured. His wartime memoranda, once classified, eventually became foundational texts in statistics, operational research, and critical thinking. They remind us that success and survival are only half the story, that for every survivor, there are countless unseen failures. Abraham Wald taught the world to look beyond the obvious, to question assumptions, and to see what is not there, proving that sometimes the most important evidence is hidden in absence, and that true insight often comes not from the planes that returned, but from those that never made it home. His lessons continue to protect lives, shape decisions, and guide human understanding across disciplines more than 70 years later.